Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar, Succession Planning for the Solid Waste Industry. My name is Sarah Bolton and I am the new business development manager here at Blue Ridge Services and I will also be today's webinar moderator. So before we get started, um, I wanted to just cover a couple of quick technical and housekeeping items. First thing is when you logged in to uh, GoToMeeting, you should have seen a control panel. And, <clears throat> excuse me, if you don't see the full control panel as it's pictured here on my screen, um, you can click this little orange arrow and it should expand the full control panel out. So a couple of things to notice um, on your control panel. First of all is the audio. So you've, you're either using the audio through your computer, mic, and speakers, or you've called in through your telephone. If you called in through the phone, um, please make sure you put your audio PIN number in. And if you didn't, uh, if you don't know what that is, you can send me a quick chat in the chat box, and I can help you get that figured out. That allows me to mute and unmute you if you want to ask questions um, during the presentation today. And on the issue of questions, um, we really like for our webinars to be interactive. So if you guys have um, comments or questions during the presentation today, please don't be shy about jumping in. You can always send a quick chat um, at the, in the chat box, which is at the bottom of your control panel, or you can click the little hand icon and it will raise a hand next to your name kind of like we were in elementary school again, and I can unmute you if you want to ask a question out loud. We will also have time at the end for question and answers, um, so if you have a question and you want to wait till then, that's fine. Either way is fine. We just we like to customize it to, to your needs and what you, where you're at, so please feel free to jump in. Uh, there's a, a materials tab on your control panel, and if you click on, there should be a little plus and minus buttons to expand and, and minimize it and if you click on that you should be able to um, download the materials. I will also be sending out an email with the recording of today's webinar as well as the handouts from today so if you don't get a chance to download those don't worry you will get a link within the next day. This is for anybody who might be having audio issues. It looks like everybody's set on my end, um, but just in case, you can always send me a chat at any point today and I can try to help you um, figure any technical issues you might be having. And finally, if you see this in the middle of your screen, you can just click the edge of it with your mouse and try to move it out of the way. It's just telling us how much time we have left. So I am going to turn things over to Neil Bolton, who is going to be our presenter today. It takes us just a couple minutes to kind of get that um, set up. Are you on, Neil? Yes, and you should be seeing my screen very soon. Let me okay. know when you see it, and we'll get started. It takes a few seconds for that to transition over. I see your screen, and I hear your audio, so you're all set. Okay, great. Well, welcome, everyone. So today we're going to talk about a topic that is um, pretty, pretty important. In fact, we've been doing webinars now for several years, and we have had about three times more response for this webinar than we've ever had for any other one. And um, in fact, we had to, we, we presented it last week and we filled that slot up and we are close to filling this slot up. So we're having a second run at it. So I guess it's appropriate to uh, repeat this same thing again. It's Groundhog Day, so maybe we'll do it again tomorrow. Who knows? So succession planning in the solid waste industry is what we're going to be talking about today. And again, Sarah is our moderator. If you have questions as we go through today's webinar, you can post those as Sarah explained, or at the end we'll have time for questions as well. And we'll, we'll stick around until all the questions get answered. My name is Neil Bolton. I've been in the heavy construction and solid waste industry for 39 years. Uh, I'll soon be starting my 40th year here in just a couple of weeks. So um, succession planning is something that all of us are thinking about, and even I'm thinking about that. So um, here here's... Here it is. And the first thing we're going to do is start off with a poll. We have several polls today, and that just gives everyone in the group an opportunity to see what other folks in the group are thinking about and kind of what our demographic is. These are anonymous. No one else can see what you're answering. So our first poll is, how many years of related experience do you have in this field? And that would include MSW or public works or management, um, et cetera. Number one, one to five years. Number two, six to ten years. Number three, 11 to 20 years, number four, 21 to 30 years, or number five, 31 years or more. So again, the question is, how many years of related experience do you have in this field? And we're talking about 
the general field that you're working in now. So MSW or public works or management, anything related to that. Let's plug in and see where where our group is here today. All right, great. So I'll give everybody just a couple more seconds in case you want to jump in with an answer. And then I'm going to go ahead and close that. And there are those results. Okay, so everyone should be seeing this here pretty quick. We have a, you know, it's, it's skewed a little bit. We have 29% uh, of our group, so almost a third, one to five years, and then 12% in, uh, for both 6 to 10 or 11 to 20, and about 24% for 21 to 30 or 24% for 31 years plus. So if we break this down a little bit more, we have about a third of us five years or less. Um, about half of us are more than 20 years, more than 21 years of experience. So we've got a lot of a lot of a lot of experience here in this group today. So let's talk about job security or job responsibility. So talking about job security, knowledge is power for you. If if you're the only one who knows how to do the job that you do, you're probably pretty pretty secure because they can't let you go because you know things that no one else knows. So that's a that that's power for you. But power for the team is when you hand things off. When you prepare someone else to do your job, you are then empowering your team and making your team better and stronger and, and more likely to, to continue on after you retire and go do something else. We're going to talk about succession planning in terms of the manager. We're going to talk about manager. That's the term we'll use today. And, and I'm intending that to be a director or manager or a supervisor or a lead worker or a foreman or whatever you want to call that. And that's, that's the context of today's webinar. Now, I recognize and it's important to recognize that succession planning can be very important for an operator. If you have a, a skilled equipment operator who brings a lot to the team, when that person leaves, that can leave a gap. You need to be thinking about succession planning for your skilled operator, or someone at the gatehouse who is very skilled, or someone who runs a loader or drives a truck or whatever. If you have people in your team that are critical, that do a great job and would be hard to replace, it's important that you have some type of succession plan. I'll tell you a story. When I first started working in the garbage business, um, we had a guy who worked there. He was an equipment operator. His name was Sal Ratto. And when Sal retired, he had 55 years experience as a heavy equipment operator in landfills. Um, he was very, very skilled. He was an encyclopedia. But Sal did a great job. We didn't call it succession planning in those days, but Sal was constantly talking to the younger guys and explaining why he was doing this and how to do that. And so he was building a team. He was building a succession plan without really probably knowing what it was called. Uh, but again, today we're going to talk about management, and we use the term manager, but that can apply to anyone in any critical position. So succession planning is essentially how do we find someone to replace you when you're gone, and uh, that's a that's a very important very important topic. Succession planning again applies to any critical position, and so I just want to make that point. So, you know, if if you're the manager and you're going to retire soon, it applies to you, but it could apply to anyone on your team who holds a critical position. I want to share with you some interesting statistics, just demographics about the workforce out there. Studies have shown that 87% of local government managers are over the age of 40. And um, that's, that's a significant, significant amount. Only 25% of government positions have succession plans. So you see there's already a discrepancy here where we've got a lot of folks over 40 and not very many succession plans in place. More than 90% of the millennials, and we have terms, you know, baby boomers and Generation X and Generation Y and millennials, but millennials are folks who were born between 1977 and 1998. And those folks, when surveyed, on average, expect to stay in a job less than three years. They're very mobile. And that doesn't mean that everyone who was born in this period is going to change jobs every three years, but just as a general demographic, there's less of a tendency to get a job and stay in that as a career, but there's more moving around. Um, the world is smaller and there's, there's more transition. So what that means for us in terms of how that plays out for succession planning, managers will be leaving sooner than later because, again, um, a great number of managers are over 40 years of age. The 
next manager might not stay along, and so there's going to be frequent replacement. That's a reality of today's job market. So we want to learn how to do succession planning. And as we go through this today, we'll find that succession planning is more of a system that you set up rather than something that you do one time because you're not going to do it just one time. So you want to plan, you want to plan to be able to make a system out of that. This brings us to our second poll question. What age group do you fit into? Number one, 39 or younger. Number two, 40 to 49. Number three, 50 to 55. Number four, 56 to 62. And number five, 63 or older. So again, what age group do you fit into? And again, this will just give us a feel for what our demographic is here today. So we are at almost 100% voted. Let me give everybody one more second if they want to get an answer logged in. All right, there are those results. All right. So what we see here today is that 83% of our group is 40 years of age or older. 80, 83%. Only 17% are 39 or younger. And we're all envious of those 17% um, probably, but uh, nonetheless, we're holding pretty true to the, the figure that we saw earlier that 87% is 40 or older. Here are 83% of our group today. And um, in fact, 67% of our group is 50 or older. So that's a significant, there's a significant uh, population of folks here today who are 50 years of age or older. And what does that mean for us? Well, the average retirement age in the U.S., according to a Gallup poll done in 2014, is 62. So we're not we're not far off from that and what that's telling us is a good number of folks represented here today um, again 67 percent of us two-thirds of us are 50 or older um, means two-thirds of us are going to have to start thinking about this retirement age of 62 at some point. There's a term out there in in our culture called the silver tsunami and that term comes from the wave of gray-haired baby boomers who are expected to leave the workforce. And so there were projections some years ago that we're going to have a tremendous exodus from the workforce when these baby boomers, um, a lot of us are in that category, when, when we leave the workforce. Well, that silver tsunami has been somewhat delayed due to economic reasons. The recession slowed that down and concerns about the stock market and retirement funds and even retirement programs within some companies and some municipalities have been affected and so folks are saying hey maybe I better maybe I better work a little bit longer to make sure I have enough money once I do retire but that silver tsunami is still looming it may have been delayed a bit maybe dampened a bit but it is still looming and at some point we will see this big block of of folks a lot of them in management leaving the workforce there's also a wave in the waste business. And why do we have that? Well, a, a few things played into that. One of them was that the landfill business, the waste business in general, but particularly landfills, started um, ramping up. They started becoming more sophisticated. That whole industry became more sophisticated when Subtitle D rolled out. In the late 1980s, early 1990s, there was a shift where management folks in the landfill and the waste business in general had to be more sophisticated. And so there was a significant amount of hiring done um, for managers at that time. Maybe they're engineers or business management. Maybe they were promoted from within. But there was a significant amount of, of um, increase in the number of managers. So there was a, it was a big start in that, that time period, around 1990. People entered this business at that time in the role of a manager. And a lot of those folks now, you know, here we are from 1990 to now. We're 26 years into it or 26 years ago that that happened. And so a lot of those folks who came in at that time are nearing retirement. That's part of what's happening in the waste business. So the question is, are you developing a replacement for you or for that critical person? Farmers know that their next year's harvest depends on this year's planting. Managers need to know the same thing. We need to know that for things to succeed next year and into the future, we need to be planting the seeds of good succession planning right now. So one of the big questions is, where is that replacement going to come from? Are they going to come from internal promotion? Are we going to hire someone from internally and move them up into this management position? 
or are we going to go to the outside and hire someone from, from outside? There are pros and cons for both of these. We'll take a look at a few of those. Externally, if you reach out to the, to the population at large, it's obviously a much larger pool. It's, it's the entire industry. But that's somewhat unknown. Those folks may be a, a little bit of a black box, maybe somewhat unknown because um, they haven't, you haven't worked with them unless you've worked with them as a consultant or as a, as a peer. But um, it's not like having them on your, on your staff for several years and you really know them. There could be a transition gap. What we see, especially with municipalities, is that you can't hire that new manager until the old manager leaves. And sometimes hiring the new manager is a time-consuming effort. There may be interviews and, and some vetting process, and there can be a several months gap, several months gap in between the time the existing manager leaves and the new manager comes online. So that's a problem. Internally, we have a limited pool of people. It's it's your you know, it's your team. It's whoever's in the system right now for your county, your city, your company, and that's the pool that you're going to bring someone in internally. So you have to be careful you aren't putting all your eggs in one basket or two baskets. Familiarity can be a good thing, meaning that the person that you hire internally or that you promote internally to move into that management position, they're probably very familiar with the operation. That can be a good thing and that they know how things work. But it can also be a bad thing or a negative thing because they may not have a broad enough perspective to really bring the positive change that's required for your system if there is change required or to move into you know into the future. Sometimes you want that outside perspective. Um, you know, the, internally you may have a better opportunity to transition, so you don't have to necessarily have a gap. You may be able to bring that person or those persons up to speed more quickly. Here's our next poll question. How many years until you or a key facility or ops manager retires? One year or less? One to two years? Two to five years? Five to ten? Or more than ten years? So again, we've got a new poll going on here. How many years until you or a key facility or ops manager retires? A year or less? One to two? Two to five? five to 10 or more than 10 years. So we're just trying to get a feel for how close is this succession planning um, question to you. Okay, great. So we're at about 80%. I'm gonna give everybody a few more seconds to get an answer in. All right, I'm gonna close that out and share the results. Okay. So we have ballpark, um, about 50% five years or less, and about 50% five years or more. So we're kind of split. About half of our group today has five years or less to uh, get this in place. Um, some of us, about one out of, one out of um, seven or so, have less than a year. And about half of us have five years or more. So we've got some time as a group. We've got a little bit of time here. But again, it's something we want to be thinking about now and how we do that. So when we talk about the handoff, when we're handing off or moving from one manager to the next, we're going through this transition, through this succession process. The problem is with the handoff, sometimes there isn't a handoff. Sometimes there can be a significant gap. And in my experience, we're occasionally brought in to, to help interview or help place someone or help with that transition. And generally, there is, uh, there is a, a significant gap. Sometimes it's several weeks. Sometimes it's a few months of gap where there's no manager in place. And so that can, that can be problematic. We often hear this phrase. In fact, I just heard this recently talking with a manager. Um, he said, hey, when the old manager left, he took the filing cabinet with him. Not literally, but the information was all in his head. And so the, you don't want this. You don't want a manager to leave and take that information with them, take all the processes and procedures and, and all of the history of the site with them, but too often that actually does happen. So the bottom line is, in order to prevent that, you need to have some kind of a succession plan. So I want to talk about some specific steps. If you're, you know, if you're thinking about a succession plan in the next year or so, if you've got 10 years, doesn't matter. These are things you should be thinking about. There are four steps we're going to talk about today. A transfer of knowledge, getting that information 
on to the next manager, developing systems so that it's easier to make that transition, training and mentoring. So we're going to talk about those four steps. Transfer of knowledge is basically getting the information that the current manager or the current person knows into someone else, extracting it. How do we, how do we extract that information before this person leaves? So here's some things to think about. This is not a poll. These are just things to think about. How much do you know about your job, and how long did it take you to learn it? And how will the next person learn those things, and how long will that take? So just think about this as we go, and this will take us to our next poll question, which is, how long does it take for a new manager to know his or her job well and become independently effective? Again, simple poll. How long does it take, in your opinion, for a new, or maybe in your experience, how long does it take for a new manager to know his or her job well and become independently effective? Six months or less, one year, two years, or at least three years. How long does it take to become independently effective? It's word about. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. It could I was be just based on your experience or it could be based on, yeah. on, um, on your opinion. But how long does it take? All right, some answers are still coming in, so I'll give everybody a couple more seconds in case you want to jump in. All right, I'm going to close that out, and there are those results. Okay. So. We've got about 40% that say a year or less, and we have about 60% that say two years or more. So this is a this is a process, and if we think about what that what that means, there are different aspects of that. So why does it take this long? Why do 60% of us today say it takes two years or more for a manager to become effective? Well, how much of that is technical? How much of that is the management skills, the engineering skills, the financial skills a manager needs, and how much is just figuring out the logistics, like where are the spare keys to the pickup, and where do I get those forms, and who do I call if I have a question about equipment repairs. Some of that is technical, and some of it is just figuring out the logistics of how the system works. So here's some ways we can transfer that information to the current manager. Cross training. Cross training is a is a very good tool. We'll talk about that here in some detail in just a sec. Um, apprenticeship or manager shadowing. So aside from those, there's another technique. It's a Vulcan mind meld. But if you don't know how to do that, and very few people today do, then we're going to have to find some other alternative for being able to uh, to transfer that information. First thing we'll talk about is cross training. And cross training works very well with larger operations where there are multiple layers of management or enough people that we can move someone into another position for a week or a month and let them get a feel for it without disrupting the whole system. If you have one manager in your system, it's pretty hard to cross train because there's no one else to move into that. But for larger larger operations, that can make sense. The key to having cross training work is to allow that trainee or that that um, prospective um, new manager enough time to learn the position. So a week is not enough. A month is not enough. Um, we just said it takes you know at least two years. Sixty percent of us say that. And um, so there has to be this has to be an ongoing process. And it could be it can be done, but you have to think ahead. So the you know those of us who have several years before this succession event has to occur. Now is a good time to start thinking about cross-training and identify that person or those people within your organization who you want to cross-train. Sometimes that's a good long-term investment, but sometimes it's a problem because you may put two years of cross-training into a, into a potential um, new manager, and they could leave for whatever reason. And so that there are, there are trade-offs to that. The other problem with cross-training is it has to be done every time. And it works best and pr pretty much only when you're hiring from internally. You're moving someone up in, in terms of a promotion to a new position. So if you have, have a manager that's leaving in two years, you have to start cross-training now for that to work. And then if they leave at some point after that, you have to do it again and do it again. And so cross-training is a 
way to develop your team, but it's not perfect. Apprenticeship is a very effective way to pass on information, but it takes it takes a, you know, a dedicated person. You have to actually dedicate a person to that position so they can work as an apprentice. Maybe they're an assistant manager, or maybe they have a maybe it's a supervisor or a foreman who you're you're grooming and training to take on that manager's job. But again, that has to be done every time you change managers. You have to have another apprentice in the wings every time it's time to uh, to go through this succession event. And it works with an internal pool only. You have to have someone who is an apprentice. You have to be hiring them and paying them. So there's an extra cost associated with that. Here's another another option. That's manager shadowing. Um, late in 2015, actually it was about two months ago, two and a half months ago, um, we had a public works director contact us and he said, hey, the manager is retiring in six weeks and the internal replacement I had been counting on is not going to work out. They don't, they don't want the job. They can't take the job. So these folks had done a good job of grooming someone through cross-training and a, a apprenticeship, but when it came time for the existing manager, the current manager, to leave, the plan just kind of fell apart because that person they had in mind it wasn't going to work out. So we said, yeah, we can we can help you with that. So we had one of our folks go down there, um, one of the folks on our team, and we had them shadow the manager for five weeks. They were the uh, very intense apprentice for five weeks, and they asked questions about how does this, how does the scale house work? Where do these forms go? And where do you buy fuel? And how do you fill out the time cards? And what about inspections? And where are, the, where are all of the groundwater and methane monitoring wells? And um, there happened to be a park at part of the closed portion of, of this landfill. And there was, a, there was a park and hiking trail. And the manager was the only one in the, in the department that knew where to get the doggy bags to clean up after their dogs when someone walked their dog in the park. So from repairing equipment to replacing the doggy bags, the manager had it all in his head we had five weeks to extract that. And so as a result, the person we sent down to do that developed what we call the Supervisor Operations Manual, and it was filled, and there's a, there's a look at uh, the table of contents here, it was over 100 pages of how do we do these things? How do we, how do, we do safety training meetings, and where do we get fuel, and uh, how do we control dust, and how do we do these things? Where, where, where are your log books, and how do you keep track of this? And so this was a very fast-track apprenticeship. Um, that we provided and based on manager shadowing. The next thing to think about in de developing a succession plan is you have to have systems. It may sound a bit robotic, you know, to have everything systemized and proceduralized and all of that, but we have to have systems. So what, what is a system? What am I talking about? Well, here's a system that you know. You may like McDonald's. You may not like McDonald's. You may not care one way or the other. But McDonald's has an incredible system, probably one of the best systems in the world. They serve 68 million customers a day through more than 35,000 franchises, and they do it mostly with teenagers. And there's a lot of turnover, and there's not a lot of training time. Well, how do they do it? They have systems. They say, hey, when a customer comes in, here's what you wear, and here's what you say, and here's how you run the cash register. And if you're making French fries, here's how you do it. And if you're cooking a hamburger, here's how you do it. And when you wrap it up and put it in a bag, here's how you do it. So they have a lot of systems in place, but they're able to be very effective. And so when they have lots of turnover, they can make that work. Here's something else to think about. Imagine that you were managing some type of operation that had more than 200 workers, most of them under the age of 25, most under the age of 22 probably. This operation is very sophisticated. It's technical potentially dangerous and it runs 24-7 and you have to maintain 100% uptime. How could you do something? Could you do that? And here's the, here's the kicker. The entire staff turns over every three years. You might think, well, that's, that's hardly possible to do that, but that's what happens on a nuclear sub. One of the, uh, one of the people in our um, local search and rescue team um, just joined the Navy and she's going to be working on a nuclear sub and she's going through months and months of training, learning these systems so that they can have a transition plan so that they can turn that crew over every three years. So the secret, the secret to having good systems 
is to have a comprehensive set of performance manuals. And here's a list of the things that we think are important to have and that we've found through our experience that you need to have. If you want to have a new manager come in and understand the logistics very quickly and get up to speed, these are things we call a comprehensive facility procedures manual or CFP manuals, and that includes your safety plans and your operations plans. And fill sequence or soil management, your site development plans. What are your emergency response plans or supervisor operations manual like the one we talked about through that manager shadowing example? Equipment maintenance programs or inspection, all of, the, all of the documents. So just imagine this, if you were going out tomorrow from scratch and you were going to start a landfill or you were going to start a transfer station or you were going to start a MERV, what type of documentation, what kind of forms and manuals would you have to have in place to be able to step in and do it right from the beginning? We'd have to have all of these things in place, and and more than this. You know, there there are other things you'd have. You know, how do you, what happens when there's an accident? Part of your safety plan is do you have an accident form, and do you know how to fill out the accident report form, and where does it go, and how do you act on that, and how do you change from those conditions that maybe cause that accident? So all of this stuff is your. These are your systems. These are the systems that help a new manager or even help the existing manager know how to do their job, know how things work. So this brings us to poll question number five. And this question is, CFP, these comprehensive facility performance or procedural manuals, they're a vital part of making an effective transition. Do you have these in place? No. Number two, yes, but some are outdated. Number three, yes, we have some of them. Or four, yes, we have them all in place. So again, the question is, these CFP, these procedural manuals, are a vital part of making an effective transition. So do you have these in place? So we'll All right, great. Time. Yeah, I'll give everybody a few more seconds to think about this one and get an answer logged in. All right, I still see a couple answers coming in, so I'm going to wait just a moment. All right, I will close that out, and there are those results. Okay, so what we see is about 13% of our group today says, yes, we have them in place. We have all of them in place. We have these plans, and, and good job for you. But we have about 87% of our group today that says, either no, we don't have them, or we have them, but some are outdated, or yes, we have some of them. So this is, a, this is a task that you can assign yourself as part of your succession plan is to begin developing the rest of those documents that help explain how do you do things. Because if you don't do that, when the manager leaves, he's going to take it with him. He's going to take that filing cabinet with him in his head if you don't have this documented. And so very important to identify what's needed out there and to begin working on those things. The third thing in terms of a succession plan is training. And you have to have some kind of a training procedure if you want this to work. You have to have good training materials and you have to be doing ongoing training. So whether you're developing your current team, which is very important, or you're developing a team that can gradually move up. So an operator moves up to a foreman and a foreman moves up to a supervisor and a supervisor who can move up to a management position training is really critical to make all of this work and so again having a having a procedure having the right materials and then actually doing something about that so here are some training opportunities um, well you're you're participating in one right now this webinar is a training opportunity and um, we're going we're recording this and you'll get a copy of it at the end and you can share this with the rest of your team but here's some other types of training opportunities. MOLO, if you're in the landfill business, um, MOLO is important. If you're in the transfer station business, um, you can you can be certified through groups like SWANA or there are international groups. We've done work with the Waste Management Association of Australia. There are a number of international groups out there that provide training material. There are lots of videos. You can get videos online. Um, we have a pretty good library, well over 100 videos. Um, in our in our library for transfer stations and landfills, et cetera, for safety and operations and all of those things. You can get on-site training. Um, I know our team is doing training somewhere around the country probably about 40 weeks a year. And um, formal education is part of that. Some managers um, go to school 
they go to night school, they take a correspondence class, they do some online training just to be able to increase their formal education and then of course on the job training. There's nothing like that. That's where you're going to learn the job is actually on the job training. But what you should be doing is documenting that stuff and, and developing those systems that we talked about earlier so that once you go through a training effort, everybody gets that. Okay, I, was, I think I was muted for a second, so here we go. The last section in this, the last step in the succession planning is mentoring and support. So before you do that, before your manager leaves, allow replacements to practice under the current manager. We're talking about cross-training. We're talking about an apprenticeship program. We're talking about some means of having a face-to-face -face handoff from the existing manager to the new manager. Afterwards, after the manager leaves, there will be questions. So we need to have some kind of a support system. Either set that retiring um, manager up with some kind of a consulting agreement so that you can um, ask them questions or have them come back on site for a, a period of time to help answer questions that only they know the answer to. You can set up some kind of a part-time on-call arrangement. Even just a simple phone call option would be really important just to be able to say, hey, I have a question on how do I do X, Y, Z, and be able to have that old manager explain how that works. So this is like training, but it's, but it's different. So essentially, the, the mentoring thing is you've already done some training, and you know the safety procedural things and all of that, but mentoring is actually having someone who can, who can manager to manager, old manager to new, communicate how things work. This can take a significant amount of lead time to get this in place. If you're trying to do this with some internal person who's going to move up into that position through a promotion, again, this comes back to the cross-training and the apprenticeship timing where we have to have this in place and be doing that many months in advance, maybe years in advance. The next thing that's really important is we need to have the right person. So when you're trying to groom someone for this management position, you're trying to go out to the to industry and hire, you're trying to hire from internal internal folks, you need to get the right person. They need to be motivated and capable and committed, and they need to work well with others. This is probably the most important factor. Here's a trick question. It's not a poll question. It's just a trick question. What is the determining factor as to whether or not someone likes his or her job? I've got four choices here. Again, it's not a poll. We're just talking about this. Um, do people like their job if it's challenging and rewarding work or if the municipality or the company offers a good benefit package or a great salary or if it's a very secure position? Well, studies have shown that it's none of those. The studies have shown that it's the immediate manager. That's the number one factor. So Gallup and a number of other polling um, groups over the years have done a lot of surveys on what makes what makes the difference between someone who likes their job and someone who doesn't like their job and the overwhelming result is it is the immediate manager. So if you like your manager, if they're fair and they're honest and um, you know what to expect from them, you get along with them, then you'll probably like your job and if you have a manager who's not exuding those type of characteristics, you probably don't like your job and that is very, very true and very, very important. So you need to schedule your transition. Schedule this succession event and make sure you're going through these steps that we talked about. Transferring the knowledge, some type of training, developing your systems. Got to have that and then have some kind of a mentoring program in place. If you plan ahead, it's going to be better. The further you can plan in advance, the better. Um, you know, we we gave the example, we got a phone call six weeks before the manager retired and we were able to put together a pretty robust manager's plan, a supervisor's manual so that we knew what to do. But it's better to do this further in advance than that. Create good systems. And I think, you know, we saw again 83% of us today don't have all of our systems, all of our manuals in place. So that's work that needs to be done. And then make sure that you select the correct person. So we're wrapped up, Sarah. We can check and see if we have any questions today, and we can we can try to get those answered or point folks in the right direction if we don't know the answer. 
Okay, great. So just to remind you guys, um, there's a couple different ways you can ask a question. You can send it in the chat box at the bottom of your control panel, or you can click the hand icon and I can unmute you if you want to ask it out loud. Like I said, I will also send out a follow-up email with the recording from today's webinar and the handouts. And you can always reach out to me or Neil after today if you have a question that comes up later or a comment or whatever, we're happy to, um, to get those after today as well. So I'm just going to put my email address back up here. Um, and anyone that does have questions, you can email me or you can email Sarah. I think she's been communicating with you regarding this webinar. And any questions you have or, or suggestions you have, um, we're glad to hear about those. If we can, if we don't know the answer, we will find someone who does know the answer. But this succession planning thing is a very, um, very important aspect for any operation. And if we don't do a good job with it, it's hard on our team. It's hard for the whole organization. So I don't see any questions. We'll give another, another minute or so um, in case someone has questions. But I'd like to thank all of you for attending today and um, be interested to hear any feedback that you might have. And again, Sarah will be sending you a recorded version of this so you can let your team listen to it if you'd like to do that. And uh, also there are some handouts, you know, the, the printed material, the PDF you can get of this same thing. So I'd just like to say thanks. Um, Ron, I got your note. You're welcome. Glad to... Glad to have you sit in today, and um, let us know if you have questions. You can email us later, and we'll do our best to to address those. So, all right, thank all you, everyone. Bye now. Bye.